Okay. So hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Gessel and I'm the Director of Public Programs at Museum of the African Diaspora. And I'm really excited to have you all here today. We, um, of course, like all of you are sheltering in place and have been um, out of our building for about five weeks now. Um, and we are doing our best to keep public, program go public programming going and um, engaging with all of you around the African diaspora. And this is one of the programs that it's been really fun to actually um, switch to the online format because we've been able to um, include so many people across the country and from different parts of the world. Um, and we've been able to invite the artists, I mean the authors to join us. Um, so we're really excited to have Nnedi Okorafor here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, just a couple to... Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hey. Can you see me? Hi. Oh, no. Hi. So exciting. Oh my God. <laughs> Hi everyone. Hi. Um, I just want to do a couple of logistic things before um, we get started, and that is to um, let you know that if you uh, can and are able to um, donate to Moad to help us support the public programming while we're in this. Uh, time of crisis, uh, we would re really appreciate it. You can text the number 56512 and text the word MOAD SF, M O A D S F, um, and follow a link to donate. I know it's hard times for everyone, so no worries if you can't, um, and no donation is too small. So if um, there's anything you want to do to support us, we'd love to have that. Um, and then I also want to tell you about next month's book club. Um, we are going to be meeting again on May 31st. I'm sure it will be online again. Um, and the book is called Small Country by Gael Bay. And uh, we have a link on our website that uh, I think is going to be coming up here. Yes. Um, where you can order the book through Bookshop. And there are also e-copies available. So um, get ready for that book next month. And so now I want to introduce to you Faith Adiele. She is the um, host and founder of the African Book Club. Um, she ran it for several years uh, in Oakland before we moved it to Museum of the African Diaspora last November. Um, we also have a link on Bookshop uh, with all the books that have been read in the African Book Club for over the past four years. So that's a really amazing um, resource and list to look at if you're looking for books to uh, try out during this time when we're all hanging out at home. Um, but anyways, uh, like I said, I want to turn this over now to Faith Adiele, who is our host of African Book Club. Thank oh. you, Faith. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Nia. Thanks to everybody at the Museum of the African Diaspora. Welcome to everybody. Um, I'm so thrilled that you could make it here at African Book Club, and I'm so grateful for, for Nettie for showing up on Sunday, which is your day off. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Oh my God, I'm getting all red here. Um, I'm hoping at some point that maybe the kitty will like do a photo bomb because I'm like obsessed I with it. Oh my God. <gasps> right there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. That, that is what I'm missing so much about quarantine. So, Nettie, how much time do you have? Um, I've got about a half hour. Okay, half hour. Okay, great. Yeah. Then, um, how do you want to do it? Do you want, uh, are you open to questions from other, from people? Do you want it to be like that? Or do you want people to sure. post in chat or sure. what, what's best for you? Um, questions are good, you know, whatever's okay. good for everyone. Okay, so do you, um, can people just tell you their questions or do you want them to put them up through chat and you can choose them? You can tell me. I can see everyone. <laughs> <so. laughs> okay. Ready? I have a question. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a naive question, but how did you come up with these fabulous, fabulous, Characters. Oh, well. <laughs> um, gosh, Lagoon. Okay, so so the way that Lagoon came about was interesting in that it um it started with anger. It was there was a movie called District Nine, 
And I don't know who's familiar with District 9. The District 9 featured, yeah. um, it, was, it was really the first big budget science fiction film to take place, you know, where it's on the continent and it's about Africans. So it, was, it took place in Johannesburg, South Africa. And there were, so we're in Johannesburg, it's in the present day, and one day this alien ship comes and just sits and gets stranded right over Johannesburg. And so basically, to make a long story short, you have these, these uh, aliens that, were, that became like refugees, right, in South Africa. So it's a, it was a really interesting premise, really interesting premise, um, considering South Africa's history. But the delivery was a bit problematic. And one of those things, so the, the director was also South African, um, Neil Blumkep, and he, and some of his, some of his own issues came out in the film. And one of the, the biggest one was his view towards Nigerians, right? So like, yeah, I, I just had major issues with this, with this film. It just, uh, it, it was, it was so problematic towards Nigerians that it was banned in Nigeria. I, I made a lot of noise about it. Um, it, it portrayed Nigerians as, what was it, prostitutes, cannibal, like all the stereotypes, specifically Nigerians. So, so this film enraged me because I was really looking forward to it because I'm like, oh my God, this looks really awesome. And, um, and so after I got mad, I started thinking about aliens and I started thinking about, um, I started thinking about Nigeria in particular. And then I started thinking about what would happen if aliens did come to Nigeria? And the first place that I thought of where they would go, where they would go to would be Lagos. Of course, I mean, Lagos is just, it's perfect as a writer and as just in general, aliens would like Lagos out of all parts of, of that country. Aliens would like Lagos. Um, the chaos, the energy, the, you know, just, just there's a bit of everything in Lagos. So, so there was that. Um, so that was like this kernel of this idea. And, and then how did I come up with the characters that was a little bit more organic. I, I, I couldn't say that I sat down and was like, okay, I need this character, I need this character, I need this. It was, um, it was, okay, so, so most of my stories tend to be from the point of view of one character. I like to focus really close on one character's point of view, one character's story, and that's it. I just, that's always been my thing. Um, but with this one, I'm like, in many ways, Lagos was the main character. And so that meant that there, like, I needed to see this alien invasion from multiple points of views. So that was real, like, I just thought of Lagos and I just thought, and so I, I would see all these just various, various angles um, because Lagos has so many different sides and Nigerians as a whole has so many different sides. Uh, so that was really where a lot of that came from. I wanted to look at the military. I'd, I'd heard a lot of, um, not just heard, I've, I had some interesting experiences with the military over the years as a kid yep. with the parents, traveling on the roads, all of that. So the, so there's that, the military aspect, I wanted to kind of dig into that. And so that was where the military character um, came in. Um, the rapper was actually based on a real Ghanaian rapper yeah. <laughs> that I really liked. He actually looks like him. He's like, <laughs> he's, he sounds like, yeah. So that's based on a rapper. Um, um, the main character, she, you know, marine biologist. I wanted to get into the ocean and I just love that idea. So it's like, and, and then, oh God, there, there's so much. There's there, like, it was, it, there, there's just so much, so many different angles where the characters just came in. I can't say that I sat down and thought, okay, I'm going to write about this, this, and this. It was just, it was the weirdest, writing this book was like a really weird experience because I just, it all just came forth. There was like, I don't outline at all. So yeah. I sat down and just started writing this. It started with the story of that swordfish. Yes. And that swordfish. And then I, yeah, I, I read, well, I read this, um, it wasn't just that I read, I saw a video. There was this, and this was in Angola, like, uh, it was Angola, it might have been, where there was yeah. a swordfish that kept attacking an oil pipeline. Like, <laughs> it continually attacked, and it would shut down everything because it kept coming back. And there's footage of it and everything, and I'm like, man, this swordfish needs to be honored. 
<laughs> so that was where that, the first thing that I wrote of Lagoon was that swordfish story. So it was kind of like that, where just these, these stories just kept kind of piling in as I sat down, and sat down to write this thing. But it started as a short story. Like I didn't know Lagoon was going to be a novel. It just, it just kind of bloomed, bloomed into that. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I've heard you, um, I think in the New York Times, you said that um, something like you'd be shocked by how much you don't have to make up because yeah. there's so much kind of, and I think, you know, Nigeria is like fascinating, yeah. of course, you know, all the mythology, all the folklore. Mm -hmm. um, so I really love that idea. And I was kind of interested in your, um, your process of having all of these real things that you want to talk about in terms of culture and race and ontology and science and environment, and then how it, how you go from there to then actually creating the art part, how it then transforms into something else as opposed to kind of the political container. Yeah. Um, I wasn't thinking about it like that when I was, when I was writing it, it was all story. Hmm. It was all story. It was like, even the, the politics, like you can't write about Nigeria and not have it be political. You, you can't. We're, right. we're, we're like, I mean, and, and just the, the nature of the story that I was writing, I started off with this, this idea of these aliens arriving, an arrival. And just that brings in like issues of the environment, brings in um, culture, brings in uh, race, politics, like all of those things just come naturally with the story. Like just moving through that story from the point of view of many, it just like the, the folklore, all of that, it just, it all comes in um it's all very it's just like a natural a natural thing like even the the the, the part about and, and like i said there's so much that i didn't have to make up and it's all it's all very political but it wasn't something that i was specifically thinking about the um there's a bank and and like when i was writing lagoon i heard about this bank there was a bank and i forget what the bank is called now but it's like near the coast in Lagos, so it's near near the water, and it's known for flooding a lot. It floods a lot, and so there so there's a story that developed that it's because Mamiwata loves that bank and is always trying to sink it, you know. And so I heard that story, and that's where the Mamiwata character came in to the story. Like it just it was it was perfect. It's all there. But like when you think about Mamiwata um, sinking a bank, you know the political and the environment, like all the aspects of that are just naturally in that story. Um, the, the, the um, I can't remember if I called him a reverend or a pastor, or what the, the, the priest character who <laughs> has his day, he's based on a real guy. <laughs> he's based on a real guy. You can see the witch slapping, you know, you can see it, it's on YouTube. You know, that's, that's real. And like, I was so, I saw that, and it was when I was writing Lagoon, I saw the footage of that and there was so much talk about it. And I was so angry. I was so enraged. And I see this, this whole uh, congregation, like hundreds and hundreds of people watching this woman get slapped and nobody steps forward, nobody does anything. It's considered, and she's like putting her face out to be slapped and, and she's calling herself a witch. And I'm just like, oh, I, I was so enraged. I'm like, I gotta do something. And, and I did something. <laughs> You know, I did something to him in in Lagoon. You know, so 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 that was like there's so much, so many things. The whale, the whale that washes up, um, that was real as well. Some yeah. of the things they were saying that its face looks like an auto bus, that was real. Someone said that. So they were like, there's so much that I just brought together for this story, and it just it all, you know, it all all of it centering around. Uh, there you go. Yes. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> all of it centering around an alien invasion it just all makes sense it all exactly. makes sense but it almost wrote like lagoon practically wrote itself seriously exactly. it, it just there was so there was so much story so 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 much and it was it was and for that reason it was a joy to write but it was also um it was also like this Way, way that I could bring a lot of things together in terms of the spirituality, in terms of the environment, in terms of, um, you know, 
issues of, of race and gender, all of that. And you can see how they're all connected and how they all um, bounce off of each other. Perfect. We have a lot of questions here, so I want to unmute some people. Um, I think Ling Linger. Linger. Linger, sorry. Great. Hi, um, my question is going to build off of what you just said. But first, I really love your book. I never get to tell people that. I thought it was amazing. <laughs> and I'm from the Gambia, and a lot of my family speaks Aku, so Pigeon English. And I was just reading it in the voices of all of my relatives, and it was amazing. <laughs> um, so my question more specifically is, I teach at a private high school, and I absolutely want to teach this book. And I'm really curious when you envision 11th and 12th graders, especially at the sort of privileged high school I teach at, reading it, what do you think is almost at the core of it? What do you think they would definitely have to walk away thinking about or caring about? Yeah. Um, yeah, that can be a really interesting experience. Um, the first thing that always popped into my head, if teaching this to, um, to university age or high school, is there's a lot of explaining, a lot of historical, like a lot of cultural um, context. There's so... Gosh, there's so much, um, and, and I, I wrote Lagoon knowing that there's a lot of cultural context that I was, not, I was purposely not explaining. I wrote it knowing that. Um, it, it's, a, it, it's a story that you can enjoy, but there's, there's a lot of context. So like, I think that, what would be the, uh, the core focus? My goodness. Um, it depends. It really depends. You could have like a, a focus on um, on um, the spirituality aspect because there are a lot of different spiritualities at work in Lagoon. You have Legba, you have um, Ijele, uh, you have Mami Wata. Like so, you, there are a lot of different uh, um, spiritual and cultural um, aspects at work in Lagoon. In the conversation around who they are, uh, what their significance is and how they're woven into normal, normalcy and how they're woven into like they're part of, they're just part of every day. In Lagoon, the aliens come and, and the people of Lagos, people of Nigeria meet the aliens. And so then that, that brings the question of who are the people? So we've got human beings, we've got animals, we've got plants, we've got the spirits. You know, so so I think that would be a, a great conversation to have about the significance, of, like the importance of these various um, spiritualities, these cosmologies, uh, and and how they coexist with Christianity. That could be interesting. So there's that side of it. There's um, there's the you know the, then you can look at language where you would look at pidgin English as well and look at how. Um, like what is what is pidgin English? How do you break it down? And and how how is it that in one sense it sounds like com a completely different language, but if you relax your ear and just chill out, you can hear that it's English. It's this, this blend of many um, many languages, but you can still understand it. So there's the the, the language aspect of it. Um, you could look at the political the political like it's really about taking those moments uh, and, and context, there are, certain, there are ver various moments in Lagoon where you can contextualize moments and have a discussion about it. There is, um, gosh, it's been a while since I, I read Lagoon. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> I gotta say. Um, but there's a part where a boy is, the, the little boy who is um, killed in the, in the street. That part, I was, you, you can, there was, um, her name was, uh, I think it was Neda. I think it was in either Egypt or Iraq where this, this girl was killed. It was like, I mirrored it. I mirrored like it was along with, where she was killed in the street and you saw her death. It was recorded. Like you, you, it was recorded. I accidentally saw it when it happened. I saw the video and you see her eyes shift. And that was when she died. So like it was, and it was during a time of, um, of political upheaval as well. So, so you could use that to have a discussion with that. Um, but yeah, the way I would do it is, is like, I would focus on what part of like culture, spirituality, um, language, politics that I'd want to focus on and then use context to have a discussion about that in the story. I'd also, 
um, I've, I've actually done this in a class where I, I taught Lagoon and Things Fall Apart side by side as alien invasion narratives. Mm. They both are. <laughs> so I've done that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. I totally love that. Thank you so much for doing my job for me as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I missed you. Good. So <laughs> we have so many questions here. I'm going to try to just sum up them. Um, people are interested in the idea of using a trinity of characters, and of course, trinity yeah. is something that comes up a lot in just the genre mm -hmm. of sci-fi and Afrofuturism. So, um, what what does that what does that mean, or what does that allow you to do? Um. For me, it was, I don't, you know, like I said, I'm usually one to, to write from one character's point of view. Yeah. And it was, it was a different experience on a narrative level, like on a just story level, um, viewing this, the plot and the, and the, the overarching plot through the eyes of those characters. It was, um, I think it allows you to tell the story in a different way. Um, I wouldn't say it's better. I would say it's different. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say it's deeper. I would say it's different. It, it, it's, it, but I think that, uh, I wouldn't say that there's one way, one way to tell a story. I think that like every narrative requires a certain way of telling a story. And I think for this type of story, it worked, you know, telling it through these characters eyes and then even the other like the other um, other group of characters, but like there's a balance in three, you know, there's, there's, right. there's a balance in three. Um, I don't know how else to put it, but like, and I, I don't know how else I could like describe that, but there, there, there was definitely a balance, it's not too many and it's not too few. Mm -hmm. And it felt like, yeah, it, it's, it just felt like there was a real, um, a balance with it. I didn't feel overwhelmed by it and I felt like I could control, like I felt a good control of that when, when it was that number of characters, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, thank you. Someone asked a question about, um, like, well, I'm sure everyone's asking this question about now that we're in a moment of pandemic, <laughs> uh, how, how your work reverberates through that. I love the thing you wrote for the Lagos Review at how like, COVID loves us too much and wants to like enter yeah. everywhere and like <laughs> grab us and hold us and everything. Yes. I mean, the reason we chose Lagoon is because we've moved online and we're dealing with the pandemic. And I thought this is just kind of a fantastic way to draw those connections. But mm -hmm. what is it like for you now as someone who's been looking back, to, you know, at, you know, what centuries of invasions, you know, mm -hmm. I love how Lagoon starts with looking at the Portuguese and then at this moment we are now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that what you could take away from Lagoon is hope. Because like you have things basically falling apart in Lagos <laughs> for that time period. <laughs> Pun very intended. But like <laughs> for for that time period, everything falls apart. And this so everyone knows there's an there are aliens that are invading the city and no one knows what it looks like you know so so like no one knows what it, it and it changes shape and it could and, and so everyone's looking at each other like it could be anybody so and, and so like and because of that chaos ensues you know i remember when i when i was thinking about okay what what kind of aliens would these be and i've always been interested in in aliens and how they aren't necessarily humanoid or what if they're shape-shifting what if they have control of everything and they could just they could be like a molecule they'd be among us and we wouldn't even know it but like um so so chaos ensues and for a while it looks very bad you know it looks it's 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 um all of lagos's demons are rising up mm -hmm. you know everything all, all of it, its worst aspects are are rising up but still amidst all that there's you know hope eventually rises you know and i think that that's something we can take we can take away from this and that like there is there is uh there's transformation when, when things happen there's transformation but there's also adaptation 
as well. And I think, you know, like at the end, that's what, that's like the, the biggest thing, the hope that comes in the form of, of adept, well, there, yeah, okay, I'm remembering the ending. Okay, it wasn't all completely hopeful, but uh, <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was, you know, at least for, for, um, for Nigerians, you know, there's this idea of, okay, the aliens have come, but we're going to adapt and we're going to be better for it. So I think that's a lesson that can be, uh, that can be taken and, and, and kind of used for these strange times that we're in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Miranda, did you want to ask your question? Um, sure. Yeah. My question, um, I put it in the chat too, is curious about like, especially in this time of like radical change and difference and how in so many of your stories it's, it's approaching and sort of having to deal with this kind of radical change and difference, how that informs how you approach that in your own life and also in your storytelling. Hmm. Radical change and difference and how I approach that in my own life and in my, in my storytelling. Um, yeah. Uh, well, for me, I've always, you know, I came into writing because of radical change. Like, right. that. So it's always been, telling stories has always been um, transformative for me. It's always been like something, something that I do to, to affect my world and because I am affected. So it's, it's, it's really, yeah, I mean, so so it's really that. Um, it's yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't want to really go into that, you know, that story again. But but it, it's something that I do. Um, that it's 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 like it's just something that just this whole idea of of shape shifting. There's a reason why it pops up so often in in my works. It's it's I don't know. Uh, it it's like even before I even before I started writing, it's something that I found that's the way to move forward. That's the way to evolve is to, you know, what is it? Octavia Butler says that everything is change, you know? So there's, that's, that's, that's always been, I mean, you can look at it as, okay, what does that even mean? But for me, when I hear that, I'm like, I know exactly what that means. I completely understand that. But um, yeah, so that's what, that's what, what writing is for me, just that whole, um, it's, it affects and it's, it's, I do it because it affects and because I am affected, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That's great. Uh, Yeva. You're joining us. I, I haven't read all or many of your works, but I started with Who Fears Death. And then I read Binti, and then a few years went by, and I didn't know there was a sequel. So tie it into Lagoon, I was just wondering. And so then I read Binti Home, and I know there's another one. I didn't get it yet. But, um, but for this Lagoon, I wondered the ending that's having something to do with Chicago. I thought, oh, are you setting it up for the sequel that ties together Lagos and Nigeria with Nigerians and other peoples of the diaspora here it, you know, in maybe in the Chicago area or something. I wasn't sure, like, is there going to be another one or are you done with that? You're moving on to other things. It's, oh my, like, Lagoon in particular was like a, an octopus. It had tentacles everywhere, you know, and it was touching everything. And like, literally the story, if, if it goes on, it's just going to go everywhere. So that's really what that was, I could totally imagine that sequel with the, um, the Chicago part, uh, like the, but like, I think what I wanted to do with that part was, it was connecting the diaspora. Like I just, I, and that's like something I always feel, it's not that I need to do, it's something that always happens, you know? And when like, like when, okay, so imagine everything that's happening in Nigeria, in, in Lagos, right? And this thing is getting, it's on, on the internet, and everyone's watching videos of it. You know, and the, the first thing I think of is like, okay, how are the people in the, the diaspora seeing this? How are they, how are they taking this in? And, how, and, and, and I just felt like what was going on there, it, it would reconnect, everyone suddenly becomes super connected, you know? And so like, that's what, that's what that was. Um, is what will there be a sequel to Lagoon? 
it's hard to say because in a lot of ways I already did do a sequel because there are, okay, so the world of Lagoon is the same world of Binti and it's the same world of my graphic novel LaGuardia. Like LaGuardia, so LaGuardia is basically about um, African and alien immigrants in a apartment in New York, right? In the near future. That's what LaGuardia graphic is. Graphic novel, right? Yeah, it's a graphic novel. Yeah. Okay. And like that's set in a few years after Lagoon. So it's like in LaGuardia, you see how now they're you know, you've got aliens all over the world in, in, in some places more than others. In, uh, in the United States, you have interstellar and international airports. And then of course you have a Trump-like uh, <laughs> <laughs> trying to ban everybody from coming in. So it's like, it, it's very much, a, and then you've got Niger. You it starts off with the main character who's Nigerian American coming from Nigeria and returning to the United States, and she has to deal with all. And she's smuggling in um, an illegal alien alien. You know, so it's like it's really in a lot of ways. Laguardia is that sequel that's kind of dealing with what eventually um, what eventually happens after after Lagoon. So it's safe to say that even though at the, it, it, it was kind of implied, I don't know if you guys kind of picked up on it, but at the end of Lagoon, it's not a, ha it's like, there are basically nuclear weapons pointing at Lagos, right? So, yeah, so it's kind of implied that in LaGuardia that that didn't pop off, thank goodness. And, and mm. some um, rationality was, <laughs> in, <laughs> was, finally used to kind of get it under control but like i mean if you think about it if you've got a part of you've got lagos it's full of aliens he's super powerful that can transform and heal all of this stuff of course it's going to become a threat to the rest of the world you right. know and then what is that going to do to the power dynamics once things settle down it's just yeah it, it, it was ripe and i knew like when i when i did laguardia i knew i wanted to um revisit there and so then binti binti is basically like 500 years into the future. So it's like, you've got more alien integration going on and, and, and all of that. So, so yeah, I mean, so yeah, basically there have been some sequels. Yeah, just not obvious. <laughs> <laughs> now, Binti is the one that's being developed for Hulu as a series, yeah. right? Yeah. And Here for, Here for, Who Fears Death is being developed for HBO? Yeah. Can you tell us anything? Yeah, I mean, like, um, we're in, like, with Who Fears Death, okay, so, I'm trying not to say too much, but, like, Who Fears Death is not an easy story to adapt, especially considering what has never come before it. So it's like, um, so right now we're at the script writing, the pilot writing phase, and the first writer, um, the first writer, um, didn't get it right. We'll just put it down. <laughs> didn't get it right. Um, like, took some female characters out, added male characters. It was not good. So um, we needed to get a new uh, a new writer who just submitted the first, you know, the second the second rewrite of the pilot. So that, that's where we are with that. It's very, it's, uh, it's been, I've learned a lot. <laughs> I've learned a lot because with, okay, so I've got, um, I've got three, yeah, three TV projects that are going right now and they're all different. So Who Fears Death has been optioned by HBO and I'm a consultant for that one. Right, and so then we have the pi the writer who's writing the pilot, and I consult with the pilot, and then that's the one that George R. R. Martin from Game of Thrones is the executive producer, blah blah blah. So that's one. Then there's Wild Seed, Octavia Butler's Wild Seed, her Patternist series. Yeah, that one's being um, that one was optioned by Amazon Studios, and on that one, I am I I am co-writing the pilot with. Uh, Wanuri Kahiu, she's the Kenyan film director. So we're right. co-writing that. So that's an adaptation of someone else's work that I am co-writing. 
So that so that's one that's another kind of experience. And Octavia is no longer with us, so we don't we can't consult with the with the author. So that's mm. been interesting. Mm. Um, and then there's Binti, which has been optioned by Hulu, and that one I'm also co-writing. And that one, so that one is my own. Um, you know, I'm adapting my own work for TV. Oh, and wow. so and so those are three different kinds of projects, three different kinds of positions to be in, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm, that's what I mean by like, I'm learning a lot because like <laughs> HBO was the first one that was optioned. And that was at a time where um, Who Fears Death had been optioned prior to that for a film. And they had me writing the film, but working with a, um, a screenwriter who, it was a horrible process. It was horrible. Um, <laughs> He told me that, this is just one example, but this kind of brings it all together in a nutshell. He said, your book has too much estrogen. And yeah, that, those are his exact words, his exact words. And so that meant I needed to remove and, and combine just all these female characters, oh my God, and then add some more male characters to even it out. So that was a horrible experience. And so when HBO, like when that option ran out, and HBO came along and wanted to option Who Fears Death, I was very jaded about the process. And I'm like, I don't want to write it. Leave me out of it. If that were now, I would definitely be co-writing that thing. But those are different times. So that's how all of this, you know, all of this has kind of developed in its, in its own way. So, so yeah, um, Binti, we j literally today just finished the, the pilot, like a pretty polished version of the pilot that, will, that has gotten past the producers and will go to... Hulu. So yeah, that's that's oh, very yeah. you heard it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> that's fantastic. It's There's so much excitement here in the chat. There everyone's like, congratulations, I can't <laughs> wait. I'm gonna get it all. Yay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So, so excited. Thank you. So um much. I want to be sensitive to the fact that it is 540, so you have spent your half hour with us. So I just wanted to let you know if you need to I can stay for some more, a few more questions. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Can I ask something? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I was just, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I can hear you. Okay. I was asking about the use of pidgin English and it, you know, even though I have a, a bit of familiarity, it was still hard for me yeah. to understand the dialogue. And, you know, I felt bad because I thought, okay, this might shut out some of the audience for this, this book, which is, you know, highly original. I just realized that you're the same person who wrote Binti, which I had already read also and liked very much. But I, I, I wonder if there's a way to make sure that more people are included in the book because not everybody understands pigeon. It's still hard, you know, it was hard for me and I'm sure I missed some of the, you know, some of the meaning and that, but I just also just want to make note that when I started, and it's funny because you're talking about Octavia Butler, mm -hmm. who is one of my favorite sci-fi authors and, you know, my son and I read a lot of sci-fi and, um, and then when, when I just started the book, I'm like, oh, it makes me think of Octavia. And then <laughs> went completely, completely different. And here I start laughing and then I'm horrendously disturbed. I haven't finished the whole thing yet, but it was such a mix, but in a way, very, very realistic because, you know, you laugh and at the same time you feel terrible and you're so disturbed and you don't know what to make of it. So yeah, so I just, well, thank God, at least, you know, that all these uh, TV programs and media are are taking on the books, you know, but, um, but I do, you know, uh, somebody wants to stretch. I was muted. Oh, okay. There it is. Right? okay. Yeah, yeah, so we can, so she can answer the question and okay. we can go on. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah um, the pigeon English part. Okay, so that was on purpose. It's completely fine if it just went over your head or if it was just sounded like like gibberish or you're only catching like one or two words. That's perfectly fine. Um, and that's that's what I, you know, that's what I wanted. And that's, I wanted that since I wanted the, uh, I wanted some readers to have that feeling of, oh my God, this is like, I don't even know what, I don't know what they're saying. So that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, I didn't write the pigeon English, by the way. I can't speak like like uh, 
I, I can understand it, but I can't speak like the deep pigeon English because that's what I wanted for this book. I wanted the, their pigeon English to be the deep kind, not the kind where it's like light made for people to understand. I wanted it to be the kind where people are like, I, that word is completely foreign to me. So that was, that was intentional. I had a, um, a friend of mine who's a, a Nollywood, no, Nollywood is Nigeria's film industry, uh, a Nollywood um, director who I, I, wrote the, I wrote the dialogue and then, and then, you know, I wrote it in as much pidgin English as I could and then took it to him and I'm like, yeah, make this more. <laughs> 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 make this as deep as possible and so he went very he went deep with it and so it needs to be it needs to read like that and I remember when I when I finished the manuscript because with this one I finished it before it wasn't like where I was working with my editor um I don't tend to do that I will finish a book first before I show it before my editor even knows that I wrote the thing because I like to do my own thing and I don't like anyone telling me what to do. So I finished the book and I knew that when I showed my editor that that would be a question. Like, whoa, this pidgin English is very strong. Like no one's gonna understand this. Um, American readers is just gonna have a hard time with it. Um, and so I was worried about that, but it was funny because when my editor read it, she was just like, oh, heck yeah, keep it in there. I didn't understand half of what they were saying, <laughs> but keep it in there. And so it's like, there are some readers who, who may come from a, a Caribbean background and they're like, oh yeah, I totally got that. Or there are some readers who, who come from like the deep South and they're like, oh yeah, I got, you know, so it's, it's there, are many, there are different degrees of understanding with the way they talk and I th it's all good, you know, it's all, that's exactly, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a story that's meant to, it, it has a lot of characters who are speaking and then it's, it's supposed to speak to a lot of people. So it's like, yeah, not, not fully understanding and feeling that confusion and that difficulty was part of it. You know, it, it's like we've, we have these aliens who are coming into this, this, um, this country and doing their thing and there's, there's a lot of confusion. A lot of it in, in various ways. So that that was just like an extra layer that I thought was necessary. Yeah, yeah. Now everybody in the chat room is like, particularly the black folks are like, we love it. Keep it. <laughs> uh, we had to sit through Shakespeare. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah. Right? You know, you caught on, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, though I do have to say the audio version makes it so much fun. Oh, yeah. I was like, my mom and I were reading it together, and then I got the audio, which I had while I was cooking, and my husband, who's Nigerian, every time he'd come in, he'd be like, eh, what's going yeah. on here? Now? <laughs> we have so much fun. <laughs> can imagine. So it was yeah, great. the audio version, like, there are several of my books where I'm like, the audio version really help readers to hear exactly yeah. how these people are speaking, mm -hmm. and, and there's really no other way, and, and that's like this... Um, this conversation I've kind of been having with oral storytelling and yeah. written, the written word. I've been in conversation with that for years now. And, and it's like, and that's why I like audiobooks so much because mm -hmm. some of the things when, when I'm writing and I even like when I'm writing, I have my, my computer, it reads what I'm writing out loud. Oh, cool. So it's like, I'm here, I hear more of it than I'm writing. And, and, and so it's, and there are certain certain books that I've written where it's better told, like it's better spoken than it is um, than it's it is read. And I think Lagoon is one of those. Who fears death? Also, I think feels better if it's spoken. But like that's just that conversation between the spoken word and oral. That's um, that will con I will continue having because I don't. There's no there's no answer to it. But right, yeah. Yeah, it's always the, the, the challenge of getting, you know, African lives, yeah. diasporic lives on the page because they are so oral and so rich. Yeah. yeah. So how, do you, how do you do that? How do you do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, I was also wondering how, um, just in terms of, I mean, you write, you write short form, you write long form, you write for children, you write for adults, you're doing comics, you're doing yeah. graphic novels. Um, I mean, you even did a memoir. I mean, it's like really fantastic. And is, are these just ways of, do you say yes to everything to help you like learn new narrative skills also with the film writing? Or is there ever anything you think you can't do where do you say like this story needs to be in this form and that's 
that's what determines it? Yeah, it's it's a little bit of, of both of those. Um, it, it's in terms of the lengths, it's the, the story dictates how long this, the story will be. So like the novellas, I never set out, set out to write a novella. Like I, I finished Binti and I remember thinking, okay, well, what is that? <laughs> you know, I had no idea what that was. I'm like, this isn't a novel. This is not a short story. I don't, I had to Google the word count to figure out that it was a, it was a novella. So it was like, and then, and then the next one, when, and I, when I wrote Binti, the part two, I hadn't, you know, I wasn't planning on writing it. Even with the first one, no publisher was expecting anything from me with that. You know, I just wrote, I just, I had a massive urge to write this story for some personal reasons. It just came to me and I sat down and wrote it. And then, and then it was, um, and then when I, when I realized it was a novella, my, my agent was like, oh, I know the perfect place to submit this to, because then that was when tour.com had just come out with their novella line. I didn't even know about it. It was just coincidence. So, so then, so that came out. And then even before it won all those awards, it, at the same time, exactly a year later, I wrote the next one and it turned out to be a novella, you know, and same with the, the third one. It was like, I wasn't setting out to write novellas. They just were that were that length. I can't I can't control what I write. Not like that. <laughs> no way. So like the only time I can control the types of story that I'm writing is if I'm writing a children's book. A children's book, it's such a different format. And same for comics, they're just completely different that you know you're writing those things when you're writing them. But when it comes to short story, a novella, a novelette, which is in between novella and short story, and a, um, a novel, I don't know what it is until I finish. Like, I don't know what it is until I, and, and I'm fine with that. I've always like, uh, if, if I start a story, I just see it through and it is what it is, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, so there's that, um, in terms of like the, the writing different forms, you know, when the comics came along, when like Marvel was the one, they came to me, you right. know, asking me about writing, um, you know, Black Panther and Shuri and the Dora Milaje, it's, it's, they, they just kind of dropped into my inbox one day and were like, hey, we think you'd be good at this. And I'm like, oh, cool. Uh, let me see if I am. So, you know, those were like, I, I'm also open to new things, mm -hmm. like uh, new types of, I, I'm, I'm just interested in different types of writing. So when they come, if I like it, if it's interesting to me, I will just go and see what's up with that. I don't have like a, there's no plan. <laughs> That's one, one thing I'm always saying, I have no plan. I'm like not a planner at all. So I just kind of do things and I get led to the something intuitively, like there's something in me that intuitively knows which way to go and I go there. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that's how I wound up writing comics and then screenplays and, and, uh, and then the memoir. Uh, memoir has always been something that, that uh, it's almost the first thing I was writing. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like the first thing, like, for, well, the first thing I wrote was a short story, which was fiction, but the, the short story was based on a real moment that I dealt, you know, a real moment in my life. So memoir has always come naturally to me. I used to write opinion columns in, in newspapers. I wrote one for like eight years. Um, so like that format has always been natural, uh, natural for me. And I've always been good at that. The one type of writing that I can't do at all is poetry. <laughs> I, just, I can't write poetry and I'm fine with that. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like sports. I could do almost every sport except swimming. <laughs> I can't. I sink. For some reason, I just sink. So it's fine. You know, we can't can't do everything. That's 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 right. Cool. The superhero has to have like one weakness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <That's> hilarious. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Yes. I have one question. What? What about love stories? Like, like just the rom-com? Just... Oh, um... <laughs> you know, I think I'd have it in me. I do think I'd have it in me. I do. I just feel like there'd have to be an alien or something. <laughs> but <laughs> an alien or a ghost 
<laughs> something, you know, in there. But yeah, I mean, I like, I do enjoy those, those types of stories. I do. I, I like them. Um, but I, do, I think I, yeah, yeah. I think I have that. I, I think I, I could, I could see myself doing at least one. And I will say, no one's allowed to look this up. Nobody. Okay. Um, I did write one script for, I, I've done it one Nollywood script and it is out there and it was a romantic, <laughs> it was, yeah, it was romance. And so I've done it before, you know, yeah, that's all I'll say. I will not give any details, but yeah, it's out there. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, there's some somebody's asking about the gods. They're like, please ask her about gods must be crazy before she leaves. But I don't know what that means. What I'm supposed to be asking? Oh, the gods must be yes. That was in uh -huh. yeah. That was. <laughs> when I, I mean, it was, it was in there. Yeah, there's a. I can't remember what was the reference though. There's a coke bo or a coke bottle in there. There's a coke bottle and yeah. um, uh, yeah, yeah. That was someplace and and one of the characters said. Well, the gods must be really crazy. And oh, yeah. I remember yeah. seeing that film when it first came out. Yeah. And one of my friends nicknamed it the gods must be racist. Yes. <laughs> my question is yeah. did you have, did you have I, I presume that you've seen the film, mm -hmm. but did you have a reaction like you had to District, District 9 or? Yeah, it, but it's, it's been a long time since I saw that film and I remember recently trying to find it where I could see it again because I saw it in a college class ah, right? and it yeah. made me really angry. I it was, it was kind of bad. I mean, yeah, it was that, very problematic. It was, it was made very problematic. the time of, of apartheid and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. It was a problem. Anyway, this was my first book of yours that, that I read, and I really liked it. Cool, cool. So. It's a weird, weird one to start with for me. <laughs> like, oh. about that, it was my agent actually, when he read it, he was like, oh, God, <laughs> he put this one back in the shelf. <laughs> this one is too weird. This is too out there. Um, it's so different. Yeah, it, it's so different from what you normally do. You know, let's just come back to this one in the future. That's what he said. Oh, wow. And I was like, no, I want to put this one out there. And, and it, it was a lot. There's a reason why it was first published in the UK and then in the United States. And that's very backwards and it kind of messed up its trajectory in many ways because of that. And the reason why it was first published in the UK was because it, um, when I told my editor about it, my editor for Who Fears Death, um, I made the mistake of saying that it was a, a it was a first contact narrative, but it wasn't commercial. That's what I said. You know, I described it as not. I guess that's like the kiss of death. You know, so when I said it wasn't commercial, she was like, "Oh yeah." Anyway, you know, she was not interested. And then um, a UK publisher came around and like, "Hey, what does Nettie have?" And then they read. Lagoon and like, yeah, we want this immediately. So that was how that happened, where it was published in the UK before the United States. But um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. And I, w when I wrote it, I was thinking a lot about science fiction and um, what does it mean to be African science fiction and this whole idea that science fiction cannot have any mystical um, anything in it and if there's anything mystical in it it's therefore fantasy and i remember thinking well that doesn't really that sounds like a very western ideology um and that totally dismisses other world views where the mystical and the mundane coexisting is the norm and part of just the way people think so like so i started thinking i'm like okay what if i take what i consider to be a nigerian point of view and then have aliens happen so, so what's going to happen, you know, when, when the aliens come? And that's really what Lagoon, um, what Lagoon turned out to be. And yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. My this pleasure. Really nice of you. I feel so honored. I really appreciate it. <laughs>
great to see you. It's been a long, long time. Yeah, it has. It's been <laughs> right? way too long, way too long, way too long. Good to see your face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much from Moad for uh, joining us today. Ah, my pleasure. Thank you for reading my crazy novel. <laughs> oh my God. It was perfect for this time. I don't know why it's the weird place to start. You know, I teach the others, but I was like, no, this is relevant for now, but it's also got this lighthearted fun to it as well. You know, I like can't go too deep into the post-apocalyptic world right now, but uh, it just seemed like the perfect thing to offer to our reading audience. So Excellent. having you here was such, such a gift. Thank you. Pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. I mean, okay. like, I, um... Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Boy, you can so work. I put my, my, um, my co-worker came here to bring my, um, standing desk and some other <laughs> stuff so I can, you know, have, have a better home. Um, Faith, are we going to stop now? Yeah. No, no. We okay. still have another half hour of book club. Okay. So, um, hi, everybody. <laughs> I just muted everyone because there, there was a lot of background noise. Yeah, there was a lot. Yeah, a lot of background noise. So, if somebody wants a standing desk. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, because she was here so early, we didn't get to do our normal spiel. I mean, a little bit. But, um, yeah, this is about our, maybe our 40th title. Um, now that we're online, we're doing the last Sunday of the month. We always do contemporary, so what you know, 21st century uh, African literature, um, not you know, and not necessarily the diaspora, but you know, some sort of Africa content. And we have a um, Google document where people can recommend uh, texts as well. We always try to keep abreast of things and also. Uh, look about look at representation. Uh, we've chosen the next three books, and we're really going to try to um, kind of get from some countries and some cultures that we haven't been able to reach at all. Um, so I think that's kind of the summary of where we are. There are usually no rules to African Book Club other than um, I'll let two or three other people speak after you've spoken before you speak again, so that uh, space is shared. Um, and nobody should be, feel shy about talking about the end. You don't have to have read the whole book to come to African Book Club, but you can't stop people from talking about the end if they have issues and need to process it. So I think that's about it. Um, so we've got about 30 people here. So I'm not quite sure uh, how we should work this. I don't wanna be too controlling. Um, is it safe to unmute people? Should we have people raise their hands? What do we want to do? Oh, and uh, Nia, can you put the document in the chat for people as well as anything else? <laughs> Someone's leaving because they don't want spoilers. <laughs> we have somebody new arriving. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to try to unmute people again. So if you can make sure that you don't have um, noise behind you or if you do mute yourself. Okay, Ruby, so, um, whoa, okay, so, um, do we want to process that a little bit before we talk about the book? People happy with that? <laughs> oh my god, she's so amazing, I love her so much, that's my only processing. <laughs> I know, right? Oh my god, I can't even believe, I mean, she and I are friends, but, you know, we haven't, like, talked in, like, forever. And then I, like, saw that she had, like, 150,000 Twitter followers. And I'm just yes. like, oh, my God, is she going to get my little tweet? Like, can you come to my African oh, book okay. club? And, like, 20 minutes later, she's like, yeah. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Talk about prolific. I mean, there were a lot of comments in the chats about how prolific she is. I mean, it's just crazy if you look at her output and the variety of different things it is. Plus, she's also always, if you go onto her website or if you follow her on social media, she also just like releases like stories. She'll just put stories online. Or she and she just logged off. Like now it's just. I don't know what that was about. So she's just like, she's crazy prolific. I mean, it's like insane, um, you know, that she's writing these things for the screen. She's doing these books. 
um, you know, doing comics, did the memoir, and then she just, but she's always coming up with story ideas. So you can read a lot of that stuff just on her website or at other places. So um, it's when she gave herself permission to write this stuff, and it was a bit of a, a bit of a journey, you know, because like Nigerian families would be like very upset about, you know, stuff that's considered satanic. And so doing that, and then also going through the American system, where, you know, it's like, black writers are supposed to write, you know, like social realists kind of, you know, novels, you're not supposed to be dealing with, you know, sci fi. And so she had to overcome a lot of things. And then once she started writing, it was just like so much stuff, you can't stop her. So yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, my music. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I was actually agreeing, agreeing with you aloud. Um, I think, you know, I was trying to ask the question, um, you know, particularly in Nigerian culture, West African culture, it's probably uh, consistent across the diaspora, but um, there are certain expectations and certain ways that your family and, and your people expect you to live in this world, but also refer to them, right? So I was just wondering how she balanced that kind of being kind of outside of the box with her work um, and a lot of her writing, um, but not being too threatening because she does touch, talk about how she touches on a lot of political issues that are sensitive. Mm -hmm. And people get threatened regularly. Like it's not a game over there. This, this idea of freedom of speech is a little different. So um, just always being cognizant of how that affects you, but also your family, I think is unique, particularly for um, uh, writers coming from developing worlds, whether it's South America, Africa, or India, or other places. Um, I think that's a prevalent issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I definitely know that. And I think in Nigeria, in Nigeria it's always a continuum because like initially there's like, oh my God, it's satanic. Why are you doing it? And then once you become famous, they're like, oh, I always loved her. Yes, my sister, I always supported her because we really get behind those people we're proud of. <laughs> so if you do well, you can always count on Nigerians having your back later on. <laughs> but um, I mean, it was interesting. She talked about like, um, you know, asking about certain like Igbo ceremonies and people just like, you know, this whole thing, if you're not supposed to talk about traditional stuff. And of course, she's the kind of person that if you tell her she can't know about it, then she must know about it. She must research it. She must write it, you know. Um, and then I think it does. I think we've talked about how being between cultures, being first generation can actually be helpful because you're, you're not stuck in Nigeria the whole time. You know, you don't have to pay attention to that kind of social control you can come to the US and you can kind of go back and forth. And that also allows you to see things that are considered that people who've grown up with them don't even question them. So you can be like, oh, that's really interesting to me. That's really fascinating. I see parallels in you know, science fiction and I wanna, I wanna write about it. Um, I think also having gone through the, the kind of physical trauma of having to stop the being an athlete and becoming paralyzed, which she writes about in her memoir, then kind of freed her to really follow what her passion is and decided there's no time to waste, that she should really do what she wants to do. So, I'm really glad you mentioned, Faith, that there was a memoir, because I had no idea. I just started with, I. Who Fears Death resonated with me for like two or three years. I bought the book for everybody I knew. And I was mostly excited because she looks like the twin sister of my aunt. So, um, so I bought the book to get that picture for people in our family. It's like, look, <laughs> like this spinning image. But um, I didn't even know there was a memoir. It was like hard to, I didn't know. I don't go to websites. So I go from the library. <laughs> ton of books so it's like I'm working my way but thank you so much I really appreciate it yeah no, my pleasure and hey Holly I see your little your little photobomb guy that was cute to see him yep always <laughs> here <laughs> <laughs> I miss him uh, so yeah and yeah so ha you know kind of I it's weird because I knew her when she was young but I actually didn't realize that she had gone through that um you know, that kind of that trauma of being paralyzed uh, and that then that kind of opened her up to, to write the sci-fi, which I thought was really interesting that she chose then to write about it. Um, so, good. Um, do we want to talk about the book now? Or? <laughs> okay. Yes. 
<laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, what are some things that we want to talk about with regard to it? So, I, you know, we let we can start from the beginning, right? Like, um, I mean, mm -hmm. I really was taken by the opening, like even the, mm -hmm. the quotes, like it, it, they came across as somewhat, you know, somewhat tongue in cheek, and it was like, oh, like <laughs> who are these people? Um, I, I just remember they're quite clever, and you know, I did not know that kind of history of um, Lagos and the Portuguese and Lagoon. So like oh, that, yeah. that that was really beautiful to like kind of anchor us in that to open it up um something very real and historical um leading to this very um high sci-fi kind of world i thought that was really cool mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i really appreciated that right off the bat i was like oh of course you know um and the fact that you know the west would not even believe aliens would land in a place like nigeria and i was like wait we've been you know we've been invaded from jump so uh, i thought that was just such a smart way of like <laughs> you know introducing right away describing what Af african futurism is by like putting those together um and then also bringing in the swordfish story which actually is real so i love that you know like so many things like you know, the mythologies are real, the folklore is real, um, and then that uh, swordfish story, which actually really happened. So, this is very, very interesting. So, and Bar Beach, which is a place where all of society comes together. So you really, from the very beginning, you realize that Lagos itself is a character and all the kind of culture clash, all the different groups, the tradition, the modernity, the different ways people would respond to it is all happening right there. Um, you know, with it, with the landing happening, you know, in Bar Beach was like so interesting. I'm curious as to like what that character is, right? Because everyone always says that the setting is a character. And what I really loved about the portrayal of Lagos was so the contradictions and like the juxtapositions of the different aspects. So there's so much about poverty versus wealth or about, I mean, spirituality and religion. And just, I felt like Lagos was a character that was kind of torn apart by all these different aspects and fighting aspects, yet still somehow fully whole. And that felt kind of like the journey of the novel as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and very much like today too, you see like you just throw something into the mix and then you see how people respond. <laughs> like everybody shows their colors. You know, um, but yeah. I think and, that was, also, oh, sorry. Okay. I think that was also indicative of even the, the aliens coming is that you could have all these disparate things and add these other things to the mix and it would still be okay. And it could still be whole and you can add and keep adding and adding. And even if these things were weird or um, doesn't quite seem to fit, it could still mix and be okay. Mm -hmm. and move forward right 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 because we've been surviving forever right <laughs> like taking in something new figuring out what to make of it <laughs> right and then yeah so here's my question and i don't know if she talked on this because i was in and out for a minute but was there a significant and i thought she mentioned it in the book that all the main characters and the alien woman their names began with a right What's the significance? Was did anyone pick up on that, and 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 why? Mm. Reviewers have definitely picked up on it and have been like very upset. <laughs> like, how are we supposed to keep them straight? <laughs> but yeah, what she didn't talk about it, but what did, what did people make of it? I have so many friends with large families that purposely choose the children's names to like do the same thing. So I right. feel like people get affinities for certain sounds. Um, I did notice it and I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I, you know, the one thing that I did, I thought about as I was reading, I thought, well, maybe um, because, um, and I don't know how to say her name, Aduloa, she said something about all of their names beginning with A. And so I thought, well, maybe she picked them because this was going to be a big change. They were coming there to make a big change and they start at the beginning. And A is the beginning of the alphabet. So maybe that's why they were all chosen. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, I just thought it was very interesting. That's exactly what I typed. That's exactly what I was thinking. Oh, yes. really? <laughs> yeah. 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 Ayodele. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Plus, mm -hmm. you know, Nigerian names are, they can, you know, they tend to be A, E, mm. O, N. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, okay. So there's a limited alphabet to start with, but I think A is particularly significant <laughs> okay. um, because they were different ethnic groups, mm -hmm. but still A. So. Ayodele is Yorba and uh, Adora is Ibo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Anthony, Anthony de Cries is English, but yeah, they're still okay. yeah, using A. Uh, who is your favorite character? Me? Anybody. Who is who was who is the who is the favorite character? That's a good question. I have very specific things because I, you know, I most recently I listened to the audio version. And so that is like, that has sat on top of what I originally thought when I read it myself, because I have these actors now. And so like, I liked the male characters have like really creepy voices. So I don't like to like them anymore. <laughs> They're like really growly, you know, so, uh, so I'm not liking them anymore. So uh, what about somebody who read <laughs> and imagined? <laughs> I didn't think in terms of favorites, but I really did like the, I resonated with that. The rapper, I guess that's mm -hmm. Anthony, because mm -hmm. of the music. Like I, in a certain way, I don't know, I think people can resonate with whatever these, you know, whether it's the music or the strength or the water, you know, there's different elements and I, I also resonate with the water. So any of those water characters, that goddess like figure that came, I forget the name, that's the something I don't know that just came for a moment and dealt with things and went back to the water. Cool. I like that too. Yeah. I think I had two or like two, one group and then the other one is the president just because I don't remember the last time we had, you know, some uh, somebody depict specifically a Nigerian leader that turned around or that did that tried to kind of follow through. I listened to the audiobook too, and mm -hmm. it was really interesting to hear the shift between him feeling really sick versus yeah. the other side. But the animals were my favorite, like the spider. Like mm -hmm. it was, it was so, something really powerful about it, especially when. I think about how many times animals are used with proverbs and things to kind of communicate a uh, yeah. a point or a moral, and that I think that kind of feeds into why this is a, a collage of things that kind of fed into her, you know, finding things problematic, right? And how underneath all that is a lot of hope, right? Even the scene at Bar Beach where Adora was like, "Oh, don't the soldiers are beating Ayodele," but we have to kind of have mercy on them too because they don't even know. And then also when uh, Adora, Adora seems to be kind of like the center of all this change stuff. When uh, Father uh, Father Oke okay was <laughs> talking to her husband and she was like, I, she didn't even blame her husband for hitting. She went straight to the source. She was like, how is he supposed to know when you in a position of power? So like, I feel like the president and the pastor were on t were the two like kind of leaders in this whole thing and that chose to act different ways. So I think I'll choose the president, which is wild. But yeah. I know, right? <laughs> When's the last time we loved a Nigerian president? <laughs> yeah, I'm say that again. <laughs> I, I really, I listened to the, uh, the book and I really enjoyed the part when the president entered uh, it really picked up for me. I, I enjoyed him being there and all his, what he went through. But I think Ayodele was my favorite uh, character. I, I just felt she was in charge and, you know, she's female. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and she has a lot of, um, you know, she's got a trajectory. You know, there's a lot of change. Um, 
I love the moment right. where she decided she didn't like humans and she was like going to be like a monkey for a while, you know. Okay. And, <laughs> and then, um, I yeah, I just use yeah. that uh, talent skill. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, it was really interesting. Yeah. I think for me, I appreciated the city as a character. So I think it was hard for me because it flips perspectives and characters so often to really feel personally connected to a single one of the main characters. Right. But I think like that this whole, like the chaos ensues and then it's really holding up a mirror to the people of the city as a whole, as like more of a collective, which I appreci appreciated. Like in many of the situations, it wasn't the aliens themselves causing the disruption. It was how the people were acting in preparation for whatever conflict they were assuming. And right. I think that really developed the city as its own character in a really creative way that I appreciated a lot. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that collective, the we collective that you see so much, you know, in African literature that's so key, like a collective desire, um, it, you know, ties into the whole idea of the importance of the community. Um, and I love that we would get like these there's so much great kind of world building like this small like little subgroup would come across with their you know invested desires and then pass through um i love the whole kind of black nexus and then the guy who's like part of the black nexus i think he's like yeah but then he's like also part of like the, the area boys the thug boys you know mm -hmm. so he's got these different allegiances and it was like so complex and so real um, jacob Hmm. Yeah. I really liked the integration of the um like Mamiwata and Ijele and all of the kind of um like folklore characters that kind of were woven into the story at the end. And it was interesting because I thought about Legba and um the like the voodoo and Papa Legba and I was like, oh, that's where that's from. And it was interesting because it kind of made this um this bridge over to um, america for me and right. kind of brought this brought this story over to here for me it, in part and so interesting like being able to the things that we have here they're from there and then just integrating all of that for me and i and i loved the mix of you know that the kind of the the folklore with the Christianity with the Muslim with aliens and all of that and just how really seamlessly that all integrated into this story and that it didn't seem separate but it seemed all together and again just weaving again all of these things that seemed very different and right. then being able to bring them together and that they can all they fit together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that was really woven throughout this story is that's where this was moving forward is that these things can fit together they can work harmoniously in those types of things and i really thought that was very interesting yeah yeah that's so interesting yeah i think that's what is making her you know so successful it's not just like these little flourishes of let me give some african flavor to sci-fi but it's really kind of growing out of what is already there and kind of seeing what the connections are um, in, yeah, in the mythologies, and then, you know, how, how she's placed, like, every character is just so kind of interesting, even, like, the 419 person, like, his back history in the U.S., you know, so the diaspora, like, yeah, that transcontinental, um, or transatlantic conversation that's going on all the time, uh, that lots of people aren't paying attention to, but lots of us are actually living it, it's really interesting, she's able to do that, so, yeah. I just want to appreciate, I haven't finished the book, um, like halfway through it, but uh, I just want to appreciate like her, how visual it is. Yeah. And it almost is like, like I ha I'm so in it every time I go in it, like I I'm going somewhere. So it's like when I pick it up, I'm like I'm getting ready to go somewhere. <laughs> and it's like, and it's just like, like I kind of stay like and looking around at everything, you know? So I'm like reading, but I'm also like, seeing this whole world and mm. i've never been to nigeria but it, you know i just it's just so really well written and um i just appreciate her as an author and just i was astounded by how prolific 
she is and how willing she is to try out different genres. Um, as a writer, I'm just like, what? Like, first of all, to be able to do that, but also to be able to give yourself permission to do that. Right. And like, just go for it. So inspired by her. And I'm also inspired by this group. I'm like, how long has this been happening? Like, I just got invited to a party that I did not even understand was happening. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for that. Well, you're definitely on the guest list. <laughs> Feeling free. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> Wonderful. Do people have other um, other books of hers that they want to recommend that people read? I, oh, I, I do. Strongly recommend Who Fears Death. It's like mm -hmm. incredible. That and the the Book of Phoenix. Okay. That book is excellent. the Book of Phoenix is excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, Who's Fair Stuff is going to be the HBO series by Game of Thrones guy. Um, Book of Phoenix. That's a standalone, right? Book of Phoenix is like... Yes. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they all... Um, let me see. She's like won all the awards. Uh, and I think she was the first... Wasn't she the first Black woman or the Black person to win the Hugo and the Nebula, I think? Um, mm. Yeah, so Who Fears Death got the World Fantasy Award. Uh, Binti got the Hugo, Nebula, and the Nomo. Um, and then she's got- I thought Nate Nate Jemison was the first one to win the Hugo. Oh, it was Octavia Butler. Or, yeah, or Octavia Butler, I was gonna say, but that seems suits some. There's one of them. There's one yeah, of them. Yeah, I, mean, she, I think she was one of them, yeah. I, I like her because I like Octavia Butler. <laughs> right? I know. I'm, yeah. And I'm so thrilled that she's uh, working on, uh, on Wild that. Seed. Oh, I was so excited. Yeah. That's yeah. going to be super exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And then she got the Shanika Prize. The, yeah. The Binti Trilogy is YA. I teach that in my, in my YA class. Um, and then the Akata Witch series, too, is also YA. And then there's some kids stuff. Um, I almost chose Who Fears Death, but it felt so kind of grim, post-apocalyptic. I was like, ah, Lagoon is fun <laughs> and has, you know, invaders. <laughs> so I was like, let that be the gateway drug. <laughs> Does anyone I want know to her... run out and do the others. <laughs> Does anyone know what her memoir is called? Yeah, it's called uh, Broken Spaces and Broken Places and Outer Spaces. Okay, so something Thanks. book of Phoenix is prequel to Who Fears Death. Yeah. The only other thing though I would love to say is that um, because I just joined in the fall, um, the list is great for the African Book Club. I somehow there's a meta level like beyond even Nettie Akorafor where it's really helping me to um, you know, this is like, um, it's just reframing my views of literature and the sort of thinking of African and African diaspora literature as its own world and universe in and of itself. And that these things, so some of the pidgin English people brought up, it's been in some of the other past books that, you know, you learn a little bit at a time and you can feel the dominance of Nigeria compared to some other countries. It's fascinating and it's really great. So for anyone who's new to the African book club, there's another level of like every time we have these amazing discussions and we are reading some things you might have read already or heard of and some that you might never have. And I, it's been, it has so enriched my my life as both a poet and just a, a reader. And I thank you so much and to all of you guys. Yay. Yeah. And I have to give snaps to my, the co-founder of African Book Club, who is right here, Holly. Identify yourself. <laughs> so Holly and I founded hey, African everybody. Book Club like five years ago, uh, back <laughs> when it was in Oakland. Yeah. Oh, man. That seems like so long ago. Yeah, an octopus. We have it a few other places, but yeah, I typed in the chat box, you know, African literature has such a different set of expectations. You know, Americans were like, happy ending, all this stuff. And <laughs> you read these books and you're like, no, why did it end like that? And it's like, hey, that's, it. it's a different view of what a story is. So I, it stretched me a lot. You know, I learned a lot from it. So yeah, um, it's really cool. So yeah, I miss seeing 
you all and being a part of it. Uh, it's great to see you. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. See. So we used to be at uh, Octopus Literary Salon, and then they went under, and Holly went back to school and had a baby, and I was like flipping out. And then Elizabeth and Neo were like, "Hey, we can save you over here at Moad." <laughs> so it's been kind of it all worked out. So that's good. Uh, and then the pandemic came along, and so then we're like, Zoom is our friend. And I'm loving being on Zoom because, so do we have, where are people from? Like last time we had people like from what, Australia, Belgium, France, and the US. How far are people from this time? We didn't get to do Mouseketeer roll call. Michigan, but I'm originally hey. from Cali. Oh. All right, <laughs> Michigan. Who else is in the house? Dallas, Texas. Yes. All right. Well, Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia, and we're open for business. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm. Mm. Great for you. <laughs> Brooklyn. Brooklyn, yes. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Somebody wrote in the chat, still in Australia. So we've got, we're still in Australia. It's great. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah that's great. Cool. Wonderful. <laughs> Terrific. So maybe we should tell people what's coming down the pike before people sign off. Yeah. So thank you guys all for coming and for, um, thank you Faith so much for hosting and for bringing Nettie to us. That was amazing. Um, so next month, our meeting will be um, May 31st, the last Sunday of the month. And we are going to be reading a book called Small Country um, by Gael Fay. And uh, you can go to our website, uh, moadsf.org, and find it on the calendar. And there's also a link there um, to order the book through Bookshop. Um, and if you do that, Moad will get a little uh, percentage, will get a percentage of the um, cost of the book. So we'd love for you to do that. Um, Onia just put it in the chat. That's awesome. And um, and then also um, we are accepting donations. If you wanna um, throw a little change our way, um, 565512, I'm sorry, 565 Moad SF. It'll give you a link to donate. Um, if you don't feel comfortable donating by cell, you can also go to our website, moadsf.org uh, and there will be on the donation page, a link to donate. Um, we don't require that. We welcome everybody and we love having you join us. It's so exciting to have people from all across um, the country and the globe joining us. So that's great. And I hope we get to see you all next month. Um, so special thanks to Nia, my colleague who's been helping run this. And um, of course to Faith uh, for partnering with us on the African Book Club. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> and thank you, everyone who came. I hope you all are staying safe and finding ways to keep yourself sane, amused, engaged, etc. I had a little meltdown on Friday. I'm better now. So. <laughs> I was like, I, I've been on the sc on screens for like 12 hour days and I just like lost on Friday and started like shouting at somebody in the faculty meeting and stomped out, but you know, stomping out meant click and meeting, but <laughs> so I'm so happy to be doing something that I'm doing out of love <laughs> for fun. And I'm really grateful to Nettie that she agreed to come on Sunday. She normally doesn't do things on Sunday. So thank you for showing up with your good questions. <laughs>